This is Warren Vanderhill interviewing Richard Walter, Muncie Jewish Oral History Project 2. The date is January 7, 2003. Richard, I want to thank you for agreeing to do this. And as with all the participants in this study, I begin with a question that really is a very general one. And that is, uh, when did you come to Muncie? And at the time you came here, were there any other options that you might have had as far as going someplace else? Yes. Actually, I first started coming to Muncie to deal with Ball State and had to deal with, I was an oboist, and Judy Pence was on faculty here, and I studied with her for a number of years, and I think that was around 1960. I would have been in the seventh grade, uh, and I was here for a number of years, had full intentions of going to Indiana University, and uh, Hargraves called me at high school one day, got me out of class, and said, we will give you anything they will give you. And uh, I came here uh, to, to meet with him, uh, still with, uh, more as a courtesy than anything else. I still intended to go to IU, because I had been going down there and taking summer classes uh, when I was in high school. I had a 10-week program for, for students. Uh, I sat there, and he said, what do you want? So I, I kept making impossible demands, and each one of them he delivered. Um, much to my horror, he asked me who I would like to study with, piano. And I said, uh, uh, Flora Silpini, who was on faculty here then, knowing that she generally only took graduate students and people who were really very accomplished. And he said, done. Well, then I had to live up to that. And I found out years later that she once said that I was the worst student she'd ever had. <laughs> I don't deny that or doubt it a bit, <laughs> but she was a wonderful lady. Uh, so I ended up coming to Ball State then, and that's um, that's how I got to Muncie. So that's and I did have several other options for yeah. universities, but uh, so you came as a student yeah. and essentially never really left. No, I left in uh, uh, 1970. I went up to British Columbia. There had been a, a teacher, a head of choir here, George Corwin. I don't know whether you remember him or not. Uh, we were very fond of Corwin. He was an outstanding teacher, and I more or less followed him up there to the University of Victoria. Uh, enjoyed it. Was there two years, and uh, as I told you earlier, I got drafted. And I came back here, and then was rejected for the Army. <laughs> so uh, I had taught in Indianapolis for a while, and by that time I had developed an interest and a, uh, somewhat of an expertise in folk dance. And I realized folk dance was very big. Uh, in the 60s right. and was becoming even bigger. Uh, I uh, realized when I was in British Columbia I was going to have to specialize in one area or another. And I decided my father's side of the family was German. I would go into that because there weren't as many people around. Uh, so I did, but there were a lot of German clubs around, so I knew there would be work. So I did it. I came back to Indianapolis, got a job at Shortridge uh, for two years. I uh, would come back here because of the folk dance group and a number of teachers I had, Nancy Linson, uh, uh, Cecil Gilbert, oh my, we're going back a couple of days, I'm trying to think who else is here, Pat Brown, uh, some of these people aren't even living anymore, but, uh, just about all of them retired, the teachers I <coughs> Well, when you think of the, <coughs> the Muncie community when you first came to it, and you can really focus in on any part of your life vis-a-vis -vis Muncie that you wish, I I'd like you to comment a little bit on ways that you have or you, you may think that Muncie's changed since you first came here? That's difficult because I, as coming as a student, I was yeah. limited. Uh, very few people had cars. Very few students had right. cars. And if you did, you had no place to park. <laughs> it was worse than now. Uh, so we really didn't know much about the city. Okay. And, and I think in my years at, at, uh, as a student, I'm not sure I was downtown three times. Uh, so that, yeah, th that was just the way it was. So I really can't can't have uh, an opinion too much about that. If I were forced to say that, I find it more open and more sophisticated than I did 30 years ago. Uh, on the other hand, when I go to Emmons, and I remember when Emmons first opened, I was at the first performance here, and in the, uh, and those days you had requirements for uh, music appreciation right. and the arts. Emmons was almost always full, as I recall. 
uh, but whether it be the Muncie Symphony or a touring company. And now I go to Emmons and I'll see maybe two-thirds of the main floor and a hundred or so people in the balcony. I don't know exactly how much the student, the forced participation had to do with that. Uh, but I do find more of an openness here uh, than I did as a student. But that also may be that there's a, a sort of a natural animosity, mm -hmm. I suppose, between student and, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, town and gown mm -hmm. situation. Right. Right. may very well be what I experienced then. Okay. What, how would you describe your life as a member of a Jewish community, which in your case may be different communities, before you came to Muncie? I'm not talking now about the student part. I'm talking about when you came back. Um, I'm not sure uh, if, if I can change your question a sure. little bit. Uh, the 1967 Six Day War, yeah. uh, I was a student then, and it brought Jews out of the woodwork. Okay. There was an enormous pride. Yeah. Uh, I can think of a faculty member here that I had known for a couple of years, and all of a sudden she had a Star of David on. And I asked her if she was doing this as a sign of respect for Israel, and she said, no, I'm Jewish. This shocked me, and it shocked everyone in the department. No one knew that she was Jewish, and I said, what happened? She was hired in the 50s, and she came here, I believe, from Wisconsin, and she was afraid that a lot of schools at that time had uh, hiring quotas. Mm -hmm. So she, and as it turns out, a number of other faculty members who had come in the 50s hid their Jewishness because they didn't want to prevent anyone from getting a job. Now, I don't know that that ever happened here. I've never heard that substantiated, but it was a fear right. uh, from someone moving into the community. Now, with all of that excitement and the large amount of, of Jewish students who all of a sudden started showing up at Jewish functions on campus and at Temple and so on, having said that, now I can get to your question. When I got back in the 70s, uh, that had somewhat sub subsided. and. At this time, this temple here, although it's a reformed temple, has tried to bend either way and to accommodate as many people as possible. Uh, that was just about the very beginning of the movement towards more traditionally. Basically, what had happened was that all of these uh, classically reformed Jews, uh, after the Holocaust and after the uh, birth of the State of Israel, uh, who had no Jewishness in them other than ethnicity, sent their children off to haters to learn Hebrew and to learn all of this. What happens, they grow up, and all of a sudden they're from. They're very religious, and they want more ritual in the services. And that caused a great deal of growing pains that lasted for a good 25 years in the Reform Movement. But when I came back to Muncie, after having lived in uh, British Columbia, in Victoria, the temple there was far more traditional. I liked it. I liked the Hebrew. I liked the music, everything else. That just was not here. I came back to basically, there was one song, the Shema, that was uh, always sung in Hebrew. And usually the final song of the, the uh, service would be uh, Shalom Aleichem, because I think that's the only thing they knew. <laughs> and that was quite fine with everyone there. That was not what I wanted uh, in terms of a religious situation uh, in, being, in being Jewish. Now, the ethnicity was fine. I had many friends on the faculty, many friends in the community. We could get together, we could uh, folk dance, we could have foods, we could uh, sprinkle our conversation with Yiddish, so on, and tell jokes, but, excuse me. Uh, but in terms of the temple, I wasn't that interested. It may have had something to do with my age, too. Okay. Uh, there were more important things to do in your 20s then. What, what part does being uh, a member of <coughs> the Temple Bethel congregation play in your life now? A great deal, a great deal. Um, I came back to Temple Bethel in the early 90s. It had to do with two women. You mentioned Debbie Mallett and Susan Weintraub, who uh, she and her husband Neil were on the faculty for a while. They kept saying, you've got to come to Temple, you've got to come to Temple. And I would put it off and put it off. But one night after a chamber music recital, we were at Slater Hawkins. And Debbie was on one side, and Susan was on the other. And I said, enough already. I can't fight both of you. So I came, and all of a sudden, we had this wonderful cantor in Larry Francer. There was a choir made up of, I will be small, five, six people of, of the congregation. There was a lot of music. There was more and more Hebrew, and that has gotten. And that's what I wanted. I liked it. It was a good feel. Uh, I, that brought me back. Somehow, I got roped into teaching in Hebrew school. 
then I became the principal, then I was chairman of the religious, uh, the religious school. Now I'm uh, in my second term as a religious chair, and that has to do with uh, all of the artifacts and the service, and we just put together a new Haggadah for the Tuba Shvat Seder, which is this weekend, and uh, arranging Hebrew classes, arranging uh, what's necessary. And that's pretty much my function, and I spend it, I take great pride in doing it, and so, I enjoy it. So you would say that uh, Temple of Bethel plays a very important part in your life? Yes. yes. Uh, let me shift this a little bit. In, in the first study that Dwight Hoover and I did of the monthly Jewish community, we asked each of the participants <clears throat> now 23 years ago, uh, about relationships between Jewish and non-Jewish people in the monthly community. And now, 23 years later, I am asking the participants in this study if they think that that really is much of an issue anymore, because it was a very important issue to the generation that I call the Marty Schwartz generation. Oh. Uh, the old joke about two Jews in one room and three opinions is going to apply here. Uh, <laughs> I think it depends a great deal on, on who you are and from where you come. I'm at a handicap in terms of this question because I'm a mid 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 Midwesterner. I will hear or see certain things that are not particularly offensive to me, but are very offensive to someone from the East Coast or, or from a larger Jewish community who may come in. I think relations are better. Uh, I know there were some problems. Uh, Judy Jordan did a play here called Ghetto. Right. Um, I don't know how much of that is serious. We had, uh, we've had some vandalism done to the temple from time to time, but these are very brave souls who do it at the middle of the night, and they do it all, always on the alley side. Mm -hmm. So uh, they also misspell things. So we know who we're dealing with there. And you also are never quite sure how much of this is just vandalism and how much of it is anti-Semitism. I think it depends on who you talk to, exactly what you mean by any sentences okay. and, and what you put up in. But I hear very, very little, of, or, uh, comparatively, and I was around 23 years ago, right. so I, the things are a little different. Um, as a matter of fact, I have some stories about dating uh, that yeah. were involved uh, with that, too, that I don't think would happen today. Okay. Well, let me take that one step further. Uh, have you ever experienced any overt or covert anti-Semitism? Yes. Um, I was, uh, this happened 1983, and I was coming out of an establishment in downtown, and um, all I heard was um, dirty Jew, and I was hit and knocked down, and I had my nose broken and a rib cracked. Uh, of course, these people ran immediately. I have no idea who they are. I have no idea how they knew who I was. I have no uh, inclination anywhere. That was in 1982. Uh, occasionally, you still hear things that make you cringe, like, I jewed somebody down. We all hate that expression. But again, I'm not sure how much of that is just ignorance, that people, uh, do you remember when you were horrified, because we all learned uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And at one point you realize, my God, that's racist. Yeah, right. And our parents all taught us this, yet our parents, in most cases, hadn't a racist bone in their body. This was, uh, and I have a feeling that much of, uh, when you still occasionally hear that, is, mm -hmm. is, is that situation. It's, uh, it's an insensitivity. Uh, perhaps this whole period of political correctness, which may have gone too far one way or the other, but it may have made people a little more aware of, of certain certain things you should do or, or shouldn't do or say or, or not say. Um, but especially in universities. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think universities have actually covered themselves with glory as far as being as open to diverse opinions as they should. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's an interesting question. We go on for hours. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's another topic. Um, how do you view the future? How do you see the future of Temple Bethel? As long as there's a university and a hospital, there'll be a temple. That's my last question. So, we'll but <laughs> yeah, but some more. Some more. Uh, uh, basically, uh, that's what it boils down to. What uh, what is there to keep young people here? Seriously, yeah, uh, we look at our young people, and they get bought bar, bought mitzvah, 
uh, they get confirmation, they go off to school somewhere. What, what brings them back here unless they get a job at a high school or the university? We don't have families that are merchants anymore. Um, as a matter of fact, there are the, the uh, uh, we have uh, Dobro at Dobro and uh, Bergauers. They're the only children from any of the old families, are they not? Yeah. Yeah. The, in, in fact, now with the Dobros and the Mormons having left Muslim mm -hmm. for Arizona and Colorado, respectively. Uh, in this set of interviews, the only person I'm going to talk to where I can say, well, gee, I interviewed the father is David Bergman. Mm -hmm. So he's really the only one left of that generation. Mm -hmm. The rest of them have all gone someplace else. It's a very funny story about his mother. Mm -hmm. um, Bertha was a doll, just loved her in pieces. She, uh, in Tolushka's uh, cabbage hole. And the first time we were invited over to dinner, she had them, and I love cabbage holes. And I happened to mention that I love them. Every other time I was there, she made them. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. That uh, and lemon cake. A, lemon coffee seed cake. story worth repeating. <laughs> she was a wonderful, may she rest in peace, a wonderful, wonderful lady. Enjoyed her immensely. How, how important to the future of the temple do you think that the building addition will be? I think it's very important. Uh, we found more and more activity. Um, we have had a slight increase in membership this year. I don't yeah. exactly know why. Um, for whatever reason, it seems to fluctuate around the 60s. Right. Right. A couple of people leave, a couple of people come in. It's, it, it tends to stay there. But there are more and more activities. It's a very warm room. Uh, we're finding more families are bringing the entire family there. And we're trying to s sort of shift away from some. To, to get more uh, geared to family activity. Uh, I, I think it will be important in the future. I, I've seen it uh, I've, I've seen it be a real plus mm -hmm. for us now. Uh, there are also the, the, we always have financial problems. That's we're a small congregation. We would love to get a full-time rabbi. That's, That's another question. We are hoping that yeah. somehow with the university yeah. that we can work something out there. Yeah. Um, We'll see, but if if that should happen, I'm 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 sure that that will be a definite definite plus. Well, no, go ahead. No. That leads me to uh, maybe a question for this time of the year. You know, with New Year's resolutions and things like that, I've been asking each of the participants in this study that if they had uh, two or three or four, whatever number you prefer, wishes for the future of Temple Beth El, what might be on Richard Walter's wish list? A full-time rabbi. Um, why? Talk a bit more about that. Why, why is that important? We are in a situation where we meet every other week, right. in, given an ideal situation. That does not lend itself to a regular continuity. Uh, we also had this huge break in the summer. Now, as I said, I'm religious chairman, and we are going to start trying lay services. We're going to try to and then hope to go through the summer. And eventually, maybe we can add more to this. It's, it, there is a rapport that develops between a rabbi and a congregation. I mean, even if it's hate. And you gotta, you yeah. gotta hate the rabbi once in a while. That's part of that game. Uh, but there is a rapport that, that somehow, if nothing else, guilt gets you there. Mm -hmm. Guilt gets the money, something, uh, what's necessary. That, I think, would be number one on my list. More financial stability. Um, we operate on a pledge system. Uh, and people, it's also an honor system. You theoretically are supposed to pledge so much, but who knows? And uh, only the treasurer and the president knows okay. who pledges what. And they're sworn to secrecy over that. So no one knows anything about uh, uh, any of that. Of course. <laughs> Uh, don't you dare print this. I'd love air conditioning. I think that probably oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the old building. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's such a sore thumb. And uh, mm -hmm. part of it is, is I don't think so much the money as it. We've had some architects say that it would destroy aspects of the uh, uh, artistic integrity, the architectural integrity. To put in air conditioning? Yeah. Uh, because of the system we would have to use, evidently we cannot put one on the roof. Oh, okay. Given the nature of that. So right. we have to, and that requires a lot of excess duct work and so I don't understand those things but that's what I'm told so okay I suppose those would be the, the three wishes you, you touched a little bit on what really is my working hypothesis for this study 
and that is in a kind of simply stated fashion, no Ball State, no Ball Memorial Hospital, perhaps no Temple of Bethel. You, you, you seem to think that's accurate. Yes, I do, and you can see it uh, in the number of small communities that have lost their temples. Uh, Richmond is a good example, and I, I, I can't imagine that Richmond has any other draw to it than, than uh, the university and uh, hospital or uh, professional uh, work over there. They've gotten so small, I think they've had to reduce to once. Uh, Kokomo, all, all the small temples. There. there was an article sent to me by uh, Darlene Lujan. Do you remember Darlene? Yeah, sure. Uh, about uh, temples in uh, Mississippi just slowly disappearing. As a matter of fact, there was a, a picture of one that's become a flea market. Uh, simply because uh, the people have gotten too old. You also find a situation where we, it's so easy to go to Indianapolis now that we don't think anything about going to Indianapolis. That, uh, and I think that's a part of Richmond's problem. It's so easy to go to Dayton. Right. And there are half a dozen, at least, temples in uh, uh, Dayton. There are, what, five or six in Indianapolis. So you pretty much have your choice. As a matter of fact, we, when we, the temple was having some difficulties a few years ago, with the growing pains that I mentioned earlier. We lost a couple of people to Indianapolis. And I have been told that there are certain people uh, on campus here that are Jewish that go to either Fort Wayne or Indianapolis mm -hmm. because this is too reform for them. Well, you respect someone's choice. Well, do you think that that dimension has had any influence over the years, as you said at the beginning of our interview, with trying to push the congregation in one way sure. or another as far as trying to be a bit more conservative? Sure. Uh, I actually, uh, we had a gal here a few years ago who said she really didn't know any Christians until she came to the Midwest. She'd grown up in a, in a Jewish neighborhood, went to Cheder, right. went to Yeshiva University. Uh, so all of her friends were, 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 you're from the East Coast, you know what I'm talking oh, I do about. exactly, yeah. Uh, uh, and I, I had uh, friends come out here who they either knew Italians or uh, Greeks and Jews. Yeah. So, uh, they, sure, that, that there is a dimension there. Mm -hmm. And many of these people that we have have come from a much more conservative background. We have a couple of families here who maintain kosher practice, at least in their home. Mm -hmm. Now, how much of that's for the children and how much of it is uh, their own personal choice, I don't I don't know. I know of one family that, that stays kosher in the home, so the children can make their own decision once they get older, but they have no problem having lobster at uh, <laughs> the local <laughs> restaurant. I, mean, I think it's fair to say that the services now uh, are perhaps a bit more conservative or have more conservative elements in them than they might have, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. You're going to have to define conservative. Oh, I would okay. say more traditional. More Hebrew? More Hebrew and more... Uh, but I don't know that that's necessarily conservative. Okay. If you compare a conservative uh, synagogue service with ours, right. uh, the Torah portion would pretty much be the same, but the rest of it is, is considerably different uh, on either side of that. Right. Uh, I think traditional is probably a, a better choice okay. for us than conservative. Yes, it is much more than 15 years ago. Well, I mean, I was brought it up because other people that I've interviewed have said that it is a bit more, and then when they are asked to find a bit more, you get, well, there's more Hebrew in the service, mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's different than it might have been 10 or 15 years ago. Um, what has been interesting for me to watch at Temple Beth that is that with each new rabbi who came in, there seemed to be one additional paragraph of Hebrew okay. added each, each okay. time, almost as if we're slipping it through the back okay. door. Uh, way, we have had arguments about, uh, and disagreements about uh, the amount of we have some people who just uh, go through the ceiling over this, and I'm sure you've had a couple. Or so I've heard. <laughs> there are others who say we don't have nearly enough. Uh, and I know one of the people that uh, objects the most, uh, his mother said, well, if he'd studied in Hebrew school, he'd understand. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree. I grew, up with, I grew up with kids in New York City like that. Um, I want to ask you to comment as a Midwesterner a little bit more on uh, the Ball State element and the Ball Hospital element in the congregation. And what I mean by that is that these are not just people who are employed by a university or by a growing hospital complex, but they're people who bring very diverse viewpoints and diverse perspectives 
into the congregation, as they do into the university, and I'm sure they do into the hospital, but I'm certainly cognizant of it as far as the university is concerned. How has that influenced the temple? Uh, frankly, I think it's all been to the positive. Uh, we can be argumentative, uh, but it's always fascinating to hear someone else's opinion. Torah said it can often be uh, interesting when you have, let's forget about the geographical background, but when you have an artist here, and you have an attorney here, and you have a doctor here, and you have a historian, and so on, their perspectives are channeled through the, their thought process, the, the way that they think, and it, it's fascinating to sit back and try to detach yourself and, and watch what they're going to say or do. I would say what's different now from what it was, certainly in the 60s, is that it's still mishpaka, it's still family, but the families then grew up together. The children grew up together. There was the activity there, it, w it was almost as if everyone was related. There was a lady there named Lily, I, what was her last name? Everybody called her Aunt Lily. To my knowledge, she didn't have any relatives, but she was Aunt Lily, and everybody adored her. Uh, even the college students, and I'm sure there are students who will go to their grave from Ball State, going, I wonder whatever happened to Aunt Lily, and still not know what her last name was. Uh, that doesn't happen here because, well, I suppose the, the professionalism. Uh, the doctors are pretty much together, the, the, the university people are pretty, and that's natural. You spend, what, eight, ten hours a day together. Right. You're on committees together, you socialize together, the, that sort of thing. Uh, at one time, the temple really had a central core here, and it was still going on in the 60s. Right, right. When they had functions, yeah. the place was packed. The men used to play pinochle upstairs. Yeah. They smoked cigars in the day when everybody smoked. and yeah. um, They had bridge clubs, reading clubs, everything uh, uh, there. Another thing is we have a large amount of, uh, of younger people who are both professionals in their, in their own right. Yeah. That was not so much uh, the situation then, although uh, the wife may have had a degree or two. She probably was a mother, helped in the store, and, and I, I know that sounds sexist. Yeah. I don't mean it that way. Yeah. But it was a different generation. Yeah. Well, you've also been there long enough to give me a little bit of perspective on this topic, and that is the role of non-Jewish spouses in the life of the congregation. Because I know that that's, you know, that's gone in a variety of different directions mm -hmm. in the 23 years since I did the first study. Mm -hmm. and, and now it seems to me that there certainly is a welcome mat out, if you will, for non-Jewish spouses being very participatory in the life of the congregation. That's true everywhere okay. in the reform movement. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a movement. It, it isn't towards conversion, but it is a movement to get more involved, uh, particularly if there are children. Uh, if nothing else, give them Hanukkah and Christmas and let them choose. Give them Passover and Easter and let them choose. But don't alienate uh, Scott. We had a problem early 90s, I think, with the role of the non-Jew. Uh, it alienated some people. We lost a few members. We had some members who kept their membership but never attended except high holidays. Uh, we had one person who said, if my wife can wash dishes in the kitchen, why can't she do this? Um, actually, we had to have a facilitator come in at that time, and that was a part of, of a major part. Plus, we have a dynamite person in this congregation who uh, is a member. Her husband was Jewish. She uh, is not. Right. And I don't think she ever said a word one way or the other, but everyone's heart just bled for her because she had raised her children Jewish. She had uh, been very loyal to the temple. One of those people that uh, you almost feel that she was standing on that corner and they built the building around her. She knows where every plate, every right. dish. Right. Um, that was very hard for a lot of, uh, of a lot of people. What was fascinating to me, my wife is Jewish, right, is some of the spouses wanted their non-Jewish spouse to have certain roles or to be able to do certain things. And I found, in most cases, that the non-Jewish spouses weren't interested. And as my wife said, she was more concerned about doing something she shouldn't than 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 the other way around. But you become, when, you're, when you're talking about your wife or your husband, you become very protective, and, and at times emotions ran a little high in that way. I don't think there's any discrimination at all. You may get uh, uh, some argument on that from some people. Other than certain religious duties that they, uh, by uh, Talmudic law, are forbidden to do. 
But then on the other hand, how many non-Jews know how to bless the Torah in Hebrew? Uh, how many can chant a Torah a passage? Uh, but, but you would say, given the years that you've been involved with the Jewish community in Muncie, that today the non-Jewish spouses are really important to the life of the congregation. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, very much so. And we try to do that also so we get the spouses there. Yeah, right. Um, we have tried also to accommodate with families. We tried Saturday morning services as opposed to Friday. We tried early Friday evening. Right. It just seems that Friday evening works out the best and the spouses can go either way. Basically, I think that the role of, I can't really say this because I wasn't married uh, in, in the 70s. Right. So I don't, I didn't see it, to me it was a non-issue. I didn't see any non-Jewish spouse ever anything said about them or occasionally it would it would be said oh they can't make that or they probably don't know how to how to make roadblock or something mm -hmm. well that's all right i know a lot of jewish gals that know how to make roadblock so i don't know that that's i didn't see it then it may have existed you're going to have to ask someone who was okay. married and older at that time right. Right. well it just seems to me that when you just count the number of non-jewish spouses who are part of the temple community oh and the roles they play now, that I just can't imagine pulling them all out of there. No, um, I, I should point out too that there's one other area that they cannot, uh, so, and this has to do with the board, they cannot be uh, president or vice president for obvious reasons, uh, or um, religious committee, my committee. Uh, I'm not sure about the religious school, Yaakov would have to tell you that. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't see a problem with having a, a non-Jewish principal as long as the curriculum was still run by the rabbi. Right. Uh, but I, I'm not sure. I'd have to check the Constitution okay. about that. But let me go back to the question about the student rabbis, because that's come up a lot in the interviews that I've done uh, before this one. Um, have you found that the age factor with the student rabbis is a problem at all? I mean, here you've got these very, in most cases, bright theological students who are theology students who come here from Hebrew Union and a number of people have said well you know one of the difficulties is that there's a real age difference you know I, I, I'm not going to go talk about problems of an intimate spiritual nature with somebody who's 23 years old and I just wonder what your perspective is on that um, that's a, that's a very valid point but on the other hand there is something wonderful about the exuberance and the intellectual curiosity that they've just gotten out of at least undergraduate. Some of them have gone through graduate school and right. just into rabbinical school now. Yeah. The mind is there. You know what young teachers are like. Sure, yeah, yeah. There's an enthusiasm there that you can't match. <laughs> right. There's an exuberance that yeah. sometimes you have to rein in. We've right. had we've had uh, student rabbis that we just have to say, you know, take a volume for God's <laughs> sake. <you know? laughs> Right. But but they have been they have been wonderful and we have been for the most part very lucky at least with my experience with them. Uh, I can understand this uh, what you're saying. Uh, oh, I'm going through a divorce. I need to talk to my rabbi. I can see the reluctance there. Yeah. On the other hand, I have seen and been with several of the student rabbis in, in Westminster, and I'm sorry, an 80-year-old rabbi stroking his long white beard could not have been more comforting. In some of these, yeah. I have seen them at the hospital uh, with with patients, both those just there temporarily and those who were dying. Uh, it has been very moving. Uh, they also have a program, of course, at, uh, in Cincinnati, where I think they have to spend one year or at least one semester or, or something within hospitals, mm -hmm. within nursing homes, and so on. This isn't something you learn overnight. Oh, I know that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it pretty much balances out. Okay. Also, they have, uh, with Torah study, there's, there's another aspect here that some we get are highly intellectual, high, very scholarly. Some are never going to see a bima. Mm -hmm. They're just not going to be in front of a congregation. They're not people, uh, people person. But they are scholar. You can see the name on the book. It's just a matter of how many years the yeah. first, until yeah. the first one comes out. Uh, and those discussions uh, that they can stimulate uh, 
I, I, I think all of this kind of counterbalances, and in some ways, I think the youth is good. So it's a, in your view, it's been a, a, a positive trade-off. Yes, but I, I have no idea who's told you the opposite. But that may have to do. That may be in a situation where I haven't, I haven't faced okay. what their problems are. But I do know when my father was very, very ill. Uh, I went through three different, and subsequently died. Three different student rabbis. They emailed. They called. They were uh, mentally holding my hand, you know, through this. And with my mother being ill, uh, I, I get this. So, uh, on that personal crisis level, I, I don't know. You might have to talk to uh, some people you know in the community uh, that have had some tragedies right. within their family to, yeah. to see how that was. Well, the, the, the full-time rabbi issue is, of course, one of great interest to me because when I did the first set of interviews 23 years ago, it was as much of a significant issue then uh -huh. as it is now, uh -huh. although from different perspectives. Uh -huh. uh, today, I think that it seems to be an issue that really focuses on having a spiritual leader of the congregation 24-7, uh -huh. and that is somebody who is, who is here and that you can call on at 3 a.m when some personal crisis occurs, as well as somebody who's going to be there for services. Well, again, with that permanency that, that you're talking about, we've all had it. Do you remember the first time you went to a doctor and he was younger than you? I don't want to think about that. Yeah, well, you see what I'm saying? I've got a different perspective. It's going to a doctor who is younger than I am, who is a woman. Mm. <laughs> but, boy, <laughs> therein lies my point. Um, if we had a rabbi full time who was 28, Right, right. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I do, I do. Um, I think that makes a difference because they get, sometimes we have our, our rabbis for two years, and, and everyone I have worked with, as long as I've been on the religious committee, and we work very close yeah. with, with the rabbi, um, has said it takes half the year, half of the time they're here, just to get to meet the people. By the end of the first year, they're just getting to know them, know their personalities, and so on. Now, if they're here the second year, then they can really start to do something. Mm -hmm. But what are we talking about, 18 visits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So that's, yeah. and they come in the first time, they're inundated, everybody shows up. Yeah. Then almost immediately comes the high holidays, which means you have these people that no one will see again until next year. So these poor students are going, uh, you know, who the hell are these people? <laughs> and which ones do I have to remember? <laughs> Strangers in the night. <laughs> Well, that's all the questions I have, but in, in uh, all these interviews, I want to give you an opportunity to uh, add anything that you might wish that perhaps we haven't covered, because this is uh, really a, a two-way street. It's not just me asking you. It's an opportunity for you to reflect and give me any other perspective that you might wish. There is another perspective, uh, and that has to do with the arts and the temple. We have had, I can't imagine, on certain services, what it would cost you in New York to go to a concert of what we had at the temple. Roger Mallet, Otto Feld, Neil Weintraub, uh, Sherry Kloss now, uh, Ray Crystal, uh, Cynthia Miller, his wife, uh, Debbie Mallet. Uh, my gosh, how far back do you want me to go? I can just keep naming. Right. We have had beautiful voices here. Interesting, at one time we had uh, Mayor Cooley. I don't know whether you remember Paul Cooley. Sure, I do. Yeah. He was uh, the lead tenor of the choir at Temple Beth Hell. There were no, uh, no Jews in the choir, as I understand it, at that time. Uh, but we have always had wonderful music, somehow just always appear. We have some artists there that they, they want to, to, uh, to uh, have art shows and so on. And I hope this new room you're asking about, this presents the uh, menu the, the, where we can do this. We have playwrights, and there Flo Lappin has a series of new plays that are, are going to be done this, this spring. And she's also working with, uh, I think, a musical with Rafe and choreography. Is it Michelle Kreiner? I'm not sure. Huh? Uh, I mean, the talent there. And this is something every student rabbi has said, either from the Bema or to us as a board, that they are astounded at the talent that is in this little community of it. We sometimes have 20 people at a service, 
And I suspect everybody in the temple reads music. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just starting to. Yeah, I'm, I'm just using that as Well, I think you're right. Example. That, that there's no question that's true. I think that in several of these interviews, people have focused on the building edition when I asked that question, and then the building edition as a place to really enhance and develop further mm -hmm. the arts aspect, the cultural aspect mm -hmm. of what Temple Bethel has to mm -hmm. offer. Yeah, I, I think you're certainly right. Uh, one of our major problems here is being, <laughs> I always tell my first conversation with a new rabbi, and I usually meet them after the president of the I said, the great thing about a small community is everybody knows each other. The worst thing about it is everybody knows each other. Uh, hmm. But we all wear half a dozen hats. We would all like to have more concerts. We would all like to have more dinners. We would all like to do that. There's only so much time. Uh, we are starting a film festival series. They have two films lined up already that, De that Debbie is doing. Right. Uh, we, it's the time. And practically everyone in the, in the temple serves on half a dozen boards and something. We thought Muncie would collapse when Dorothy Bauman left because was there a board in town she didn't serve? Right. Uh, maybe the VFW would be about <laughs> right. I think. American <laughs> Legion. <laughs> well, I think she could actually, uh, the women's auxiliary there, yeah, that's right. yeah. uh, But no, I mean, arts are very important there. When we would send out questionnaires, it always came back about, can't we have more of these wonderful people perform more often? Well, do you want to go to Sherry Gloss, who get paid the living to do this? Of course, they always do, if right. they can do it. But she has concert engagements, and she has this and that. And I'm not picking her out. This had yeah, to do right, all of right. her in the same way. We rarely have had anyone, if they turn you down, there is a very good reason, a very good reason. Uh, when we had the book sale, it was to raise some money. Uh, for the temple. I had different authors there, including Sherry, who had CDs, Yakov had CDs, Tom Steiner had his, uh, brought in a portable uh, cappuccino espresso machine, uh, Roger Mallets, I, I forget who else we had there with books and CDs and so on. We all agreed, typically Jewish operation, we all agreed on what percentage would go here, what percentage would go here. When it was all over, they donated it all to the temple. But it was gay. Yeah, I love it. That's great. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm trying to think if there's anything. But that, that I think, mm -hmm. is very important to all of us. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly seems like there's a, a tremendous amount of vibrance and feeling of community to Temple Bethel right now. Uh, part of it is our president now. Uh, we've, we've had good, we've never, uh, in my experience, we've never had a bad president. But there have been bad times where a president had to operate on a much different level. Um, and Eliadis, to, to my mind, is doing a wonderful, wonderful job. There, as far as I know, there are no hidden agendas on anyone's part. Uh, I don't know of any anger on anyone's. I don't know. She puts the, the situation, the board meeting's gone forever, but she puts you in the situation where if you have a problem, put it on the table. I can't solve the problem until I know what the problem is. That has not always been the case, and I'm not faulting any other president. It's been sometimes there, there was enough tension you didn't want to bring certain factors to the fore. Um, also, it's, it's like a performer. You feed off of each other. It just gets a certain energy going. Uh, on the holidays, for instance, people get excited about the holidays. You start planning things, you start planning and you start doing things. Then it's a matter of carrying them out. And each time you do this, there's a little more excitement built. And it feeds uh, from itself. And somehow it manages to, to keep itself going. Mm -hmm. so. well, I think some of that has to do with the age cohort that really is the core of the congregation right now. That you've got a, a lot of people at one end who see this as their kids being involved, mm -hmm. or at the other end uh, perhaps more senior people, but not the Marty Schwartz generation mm -hmm. senior people, but people who might be in their 50s or 60s, and that that seems to be the kind of clustering that's taking place right now in the congregation. My biggest concern, let's say just five or six years ago, is that you had Marty and Helen, Bernard Ruthron, um, Bertha Bergauer, I don't think anyone else here. Then you had 
Ken Davis, uh, the Malmans, me, here. Gap. Yeah, no, that's not Then true. you yeah. go down to the Zintsovs and the Hirsches. Right. Gap. Yeah. And then you went down to uh, Lars Schmutty and Mark Greenberg. Nothing. Large gaps. Right. Right. And we have seen as this generation passes on that there is no one in this. It, actually, the only person that actually that fit in that group would have been Bob, the people would have been Bob and Judy Core. They were the only ones right. that we could find that actually bridged that gap. Well, of course, they're in Indianapolis now. And they served, both of them, as presidents of the temple yeah. here, and, and both very distinguished service here, and have always been generous to the temple. But that was what concerned me then. Now, somehow, I don't know how it happened, but there have been people who move in that have kind of, yeah. kind of bridged this. But if either people have moved in, or when I think of some of the people I know, in the larger Muncie community as well as Ball State, who have come back to the temple, mm -hmm. uh, that they might have been a, affiliated with the congregation at one point, left, and now seem to be uh, much more interested in the life of the temple community. This is, of course, one of the most maddening things we have, is we have a list this long of faculty members, doctors, whatever, right. uh, and we can't get them to even look at us. We don't know exactly why, but I have a, a good friend on the faculty here. I think she sat foot in the temple maybe once or twice, and she's been here almost 30 years. She has absolutely no interest. Continue. Okay. <laughs> well, that was, that well, was, no, I mean, there isn't much more, but <coughs> I think your point, uh, to go back to where we ended the conversation when the, uh, when the tape ran out, has to do with a lot of people who may be out there, if you will, and the temple trying to find ways to reach them and to perhaps bring them more into the life of the congregation. There also, and I've noticed this in the past couple of years, more of um, an inclination to be more visible. Yeah. Uh, we now list our services in the paper. Uh, of course, David can tell your story about how difficult it was right. to explain that this is not a church, <laughs> but that's a different story. Uh, more social activity. Uh, we are doing uh, with this uh, men's shelter, uh, Habitat for Humanity, uh, a number of things. We're becoming more visible. And I think there was a time here, uh, where, and there still are a few people here, who just prefer that no one knows where we are. It's amazing how many people that have lived their entire life here. And you mentioned the temple. They have no idea, A, that it's here, or B, where it is. Right. So uh, that, uh, that has always fascinated yeah, me. Especially the where it is, given uh, it's, it's quite central location on the, one of the main drags of the <coughs> community. Yeah, that's right. <coughs> but, uh, <coughs> pardon me, um, that, that has been a, a, a different. Mm. <coughs> now, we did have some concern after 9-11, uh, <coughs> pardon me, and uh, we have had security since then. Fortunately, uh, <coughs> pardon me, for my, uh, to my knowledge, nothing has, nothing has happened. Uh, <coughs> Can we get your glass of water? Yes, may I please? Yes. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> Richard, I want to thank you very much for participating in the study, and uh, we will be back in touch if there are other questions that occur to me or other comments that you want to make uh, as I carry this forward, since there may be some things that we weren't able to cover. So again, my thanks. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs>